What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to my YouTube channel, Richard on Data. And if this is your first time here, my name is Richard, and this is the channel where we talk about all things data, data science, statistics, and programming. So subscribe for all kinds of content just like this if you haven't already, and make sure you hit the notification bell so YouTube notifies you whenever I upload a video. So this is another video in my R tutorial series. And in the first videos of the series, I covered the packages dplyr, ggplot2, and tidyr. These are some key packages out of the tidyverse, which help you wrangle a data set into a nice clean format. And then if you're using the ggplot2 package, it's super easy to take that data and make clean, pretty looking visualizations uh, based on that data. So a couple of the other tutorials I did after that cover uh, base R functionality as well as the various data types in R. Now, if you've seen my R tutorial number four on all the data types, I do make a lot of mention of the fact that dates and date times can be a little bit tricky to work with. Now, that's where the Luberdate uh, package is going to come in handy. This is another package out of the tidyverse, and anytime you're dealing with dates and date times, it is going to make your life a whole lot easier. So we're going to cover some various functionality out of it namely creating date and date time objects in the first place, isolating the various components that make up a date time, as well as the various time span classes, that is durations, periods, and intervals. So this script is going to be available on my GitHub repo. That's going to be linked in the description of this video. Uh, just please note that some of the code here, not as much as some of my earlier tutorials, but still a little bit, is adapted from the book R for Data Science by Hadley Wickham and Garrett Grolemund. Highly recommend checking that book out. The link to that will be in this script as well as in the description of this video. I'll also have a link to a cheat sheet for Luberdate functions, as well as a couple helpful resources, which uh, will just break down some various examples for the various Luberdate functions. So without further ado, let's get started. So two key functions that we're gonna start with here are the today function and the now function. Let's start with today. So I'm gonna create an object called day using the today function. Then let's just look at the structure of that. So this object day, it's 2020.09.22. That's the day that I'm recording this video. And this is an object of class date. Not much more to it than that. Then if we use the now function, again, I'm gonna create an object called date time using this now function. If we look at the structure of that, we have the full date time that I ran this chunk of code. It's 2020.09.22 at 17.52.46 local time. And this is an object of class POSIX CT. So if you've seen my uh, tutorial on the data types in R, I mentioned that POSIX CT is one of the most common uh, classes for date times in R. Basically what a POSIX CT does is it encodes the number of seconds since an origin point. Specifically that origin point is 1970-01-01 at midnight in the UTC time zone. So that's our two key uh, classes for dates and date times in R. Just the date and the POSIX CT. Now what I'm going to do next is I'm going to create some character objects then I'm going to convert those into dates and date times. So if we go down here, I'm gonna create two objects, string one and string two. Those are gonna be 2020.09.22, something that just looks like a date, but then 2020.09.22 at 17 o'clock, something that looks like a date time, but when I run this code, R defaults to thinking these things are just character objects, and that's fine. Now we're going to convert these things into dates and date times. There's a couple different ways to do this. So in base R, you do have these functions as dot date and as dot POSIX CT. So for some people remembering as dot POSIX CT and remembering you capitalize the POSIX uh, and don't the CT, remembering that is not something a lot of people necessarily like to do. So, Luberdate makes this a little bit easier and more consistent. We've got these new helper functions, as underscore date, and as underscore date time. So I'm gonna run all this code, and you can see the base R function, as dot date, and the Luberdate function, as underscore date, 
return the exact same thing, date objects. And then as.posicct and as underscore date time both return 20, 20, 09, 22, 17 o'clock. But these are objects of class posicct, both of them. So again, it's ultimately somewhat a matter of personal preference, but Luberdate just makes this a little bit more consistent and easier with these functions as underscore date and as underscore date time. Now, as anybody who's worked with real-world date and date-time data could tell you, these things are not necessarily going to be clean, and they're not going to necessarily be in consistent formats. So luckily, Luberdate comes with some more helper functions, which no matter what the format of our data actually look like when it comes in as a character form, but it's really some kind of date or date-time, there are different functions for getting these into POSIX CT or date formats. So let's look at some different examples. So I'm gonna store the same uh, date in a variety of formats. I've got 20, 20, 09, 22. I've got 09, 2022, 2020. Then I've got the way a lot of people in, uh, in Europe will style this, the day, 22, slash the month, 09, slash the year, 2020, as well as some various ways of uh, styling an actual date time. So we've got these various helper functions in Luberdate, like YMD, that's year, month, date, MDY, that's month, date, year, etc., etc., that tell R, let's look at this string, let's look for the year first, then the month, then the date, so on and so forth. You get the idea. And there are similar things for the date time components. So let's say you have year, month, day, and then the hour, year, month, day, the hour, and the minute, or year, month, day, the hour, the minute, the second, which hopefully you'll have most of the time. So let's look at all these examples because they're all going to come together very clearly. I use the YMD function for date format one. I got the year, the month, the date. Got it. Bam. Then for date format two, I had the month, then the day, then the year. So I use the MDY function. Bam. For date format three, I had the day followed by the month, followed by the year. I used my handy DMY function. Bam. Got to 2020, 0922. Now, for this next date time, I used MDY, that's month, date, Y, underscore HMS for the hour, minute, second, bam, and so on with the next example. Year, month, date, and then even though this is formatted in a military uh, time kind of thing, like 1700, 100, uh, YMD underscore HMS gave me just the date time that I wanted. Now these things aren't 100% perfect. There are some examples out there that can throw these things off, but by and large, these functions do a pretty good job. So just remember these functions whenever you need to get, whenever you're in a situation where you've got some weird formatted data and you need to get it in a consistent date or date time format. And then also if you look up the help documentation for any of these, like just do a question mark search for uh, YMD underscore HMS. Uh, the documentation for this is fantastic and uh, covers, a, covers the majority of these. Now, of course, once you actually get your dates and your date times into the format that you want, it'll happen all the time that we want to do some kind of summary or some kind of analytic by the components of that date time. So we want to summarize something by year or by month or by hour or whatever the case may be. Any of these various components, Luberdate has a function for it. So let's take a look at all of these. We're going to start by creating an object and call it today date. That's going to be 2020 09 22 at the time 17 15. And let's just look at what every single one of these functions returns. So the year function gives us back 2020, obviously. The month function is going to give us back the number 9. The M day, that stands for day of the month, that's going to give us back uh, the number 22. Then the hour function is going to give us 17. The minute function is going to give us 15. The second function is going to give us 0. Then as for this Y day function, that's pretty interesting. That's going to give us the numbered day of the year. And it turns out this is the 266th day of the year. Who would have known, right? 
Then you also have this W day function. That's gonna return us back the day of the week. Now today is Tuesday, so that's day number three out of your week because your week uh, begins on Sunday. So Sunday, Monday, Tuesday would be the third day. So these are pretty straightforward. With a couple of these functions though, like month and W day, you probably want the actual name of the month or the day in question. So in those instances, just specify label equals true as an argument to these functions. And we're gonna get the month is September and the day of the week is Tuesday, respectively. Next, I'm gonna show a couple examples in a more practical sense of where these helper functions from Luberdate isolating the various date time components are gonna be helpful. And to do this, I'm going to use the flights data. If you've seen my first R tutorial, you're familiar with all this. The flights data frame comes in the NYC flights 13 package. Uh, it'll be freely available for you to access. All I'm gonna do is create a data frame called data where I'm just selecting three columns, flight, carrier, and most importantly, time underscore hour, which is a POSIX CT variable. So in my next chunk of code here, I'm going to create a new variable called month, just using the month function, where I'm specifying label equals true. All I wanna do is create a bar chart of the count of flights by month, and then bam, that was super easy, right? On the x-axis, I've got the various months, January through December, and the count on the y-axis. That was easy. So next thing I'm gonna do is create a line plot for flights by hour of the day. I'm gonna do that by creating a new variable and call it hour. Just use the hour function, obviously. Do a group by the uh, new hour variable uh, and use the tally uh, function to, to get the distinct count for each, for each hour and then bam. So now I have a line plot showing the count of distinct flights uh, for each hour of the day. Turns out a lot of people don't like flying between the hours of like midnight and 5 a.m. I don't blame them, neither do I. Then the last thing from the Luberdate package, which you should be familiar with, are the various time span classes. And there's actually three different classes of them. There are durations, periods, and intervals. So just to give some definitions for these, durations measure the exact number of seconds that occur between two instants in time. A period measures the change in clock time that occurs between two instants. These two seem very similar, but you're going to see where they're different in a minute here. Then intervals are kind of different from the other two. Those are the full time spans representing a beginning and an end point. So let's look at some examples here because that's really gonna illustrate these things. So I'm gonna create an object called start date as well as an end date. And those are going to be the beginning and end points of the month of March, 2020. So if I create a new object called diff time, just let that be end date minus start date. That's going to give me an object of the diff time class. Specifically, it tells me it's a time difference of 30.999 repeating days. So this diff time thing, I'm going to turn into a duration as well as into a period. So the duration uh, object tells us that it's two, six, seven, eight, three, nine, nine seconds. Uh, I guess that's the number of seconds in 4.43 weeks or this many days. But this period uh, object breaks it down specifically as 30 days, 23 hours, 59 minutes, and 59 seconds. So again, there's an important distinction here and you're gonna see it in a little bit here. The interval uh, object though, that's just um, that's just nothing to it but the beginning point and the end point, but it's all kind of encapsulated into one single object. Now both durations and periods come with various helper functions to them, and where these are going to be very useful is whenever you need to modify existing date times to add some unit of time to them. Let's say you need to add so and so seconds to that date time, minutes, whatever the case may be. We've got these helper functions, d seconds, d minutes, d hours, et cetera, et cetera, for durations. But periods also have similar helpful functions. So we have just seconds, minutes, hours, et cetera, et cetera, and those will all work too. So let's take our start date, which was again, the beginning of March, 2020, and let's look at, for instance, d hours five, 
so we're adding five hours, or minutes, that's the period helper function for minutes, we're gonna add 300 minutes to our start date. Notice that both the duration helper function and the period helper function give us the exact same result. So now I'm gonna show you a case where these may not necessarily give you the same result. So one thing which can really trip R up with date times is daylight savings time. So if we take the day uh, 2020 0307 at midnight at, at noon sorry so let's say we add one day of time to that using the two different approaches well in this instance we actually get two different results and the reason for that is because March 8 of 2020 that is the first day of daylight savings time and how it works is you just skip over one of the hours of that day. So actually this day, March 8 of 2020, that's a one day that only has 23 hours in it. So how this works is this duration function, D days, is just going to add 24 hours or one day worth of seconds to that original date time. So you're going to go all the way to one o'clock the next day of uh, 2020-03-08 that is. Whereas with this days function, that's just the human units of days. And when humans like you and I tend to think of a day around daylight savings time, we're not thinking of, oh, it's literally 24 hours or 24 hours worth of seconds. We're just thinking of the next day at the same time. So this is the key uh, instance in which the duration class and the period class could give you di could give you different results. So again, daylight savings time that is a common instance in which that can trip you up if you're dealing with dates and date times in R and you end up with strange, bizarre results. Just check that you're not running into any kind of daylight savings time kind of uh, kind of results. Now I'm sort of glossing over intervals here because just based on my own personal experience. I don't use them a whole lot, but they do have their own set of helper functions like int start, int end, int flip, just things like that such that if you prefer to work using that class of data you're, or store your data that way, you're able to do so. Now if you just search for the help documentation here using like question mark int underscore start, all the help documentation is pretty thorough and again it's pretty intuitive if you choose to use these. So that covers the Luberdate package. Now this package, as a member of the Tidyverse, probably doesn't have as much of a learning curve and there's not as much functionality to it as packages like dplyr or ggplot2. But mark my words, if a time comes when you're dealing with some messy data frame that's got weird looking date times in it, this package is going to make your life much easier. So get familiar with it before you have to. So thanks all of you for watching this tutorial. If you found it helpful, please consider sharing it. Otherwise, at least consider smashing the like button. And then I'll see you all in the not-so-distant future. Until then, Richard, on data.